we're working on something that will will change everything. Will change the way that we work, uh, the way that we interact with each other, and yeah. the way that we think, and uh, everything really, all aspects of life. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm your host, Kevin Scott, Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft. In this podcast, we're going to get behind the tech. We'll talk with some of the people who have made our modern tech world possible and understand what motivated them to create what they did. So join me to maybe learn a little bit about the history of computing and get a few behind the scenes insights into what's happening today. Stick around. Today, we have a super exciting guest with us, Mira Marathi. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working very close with Mira and her team at OpenAI for the last several years. Uh, and even though I've had all of these opportunities to interact with her, it was so interesting to hear more about her story, like how she grew up, how she first became interested in uh, first mathematics and then physics and science and like where like this intense curiosity that she had from childhood eventually led her. Um, and I, I think there were just some amazing nuggets uh, in our conversation. Uh, so uh, just can't wait to dive right in. So let's get at it. Mira Marathi is the CTO of OpenAI. She worked as an engineer and product manager, most notably helping to develop the Tesla Model X. She joined OpenAI in 2018 as the VP of Applied AI and Partnerships and has since been promoted to CTO. During that time, she's helped bring AI products like ChatGPT, Dolly, and GPT-4 public and has partnered closely with our team at Microsoft to integrate their technology into our products. It is so awesome to have you on the show today, Mira. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Kevin. Excited to be here. I'm going to learn a lot about you today that I don't know, <laughs> which I'm super stoked about. Uh, so I would love to understand how you got interested in science and technology in the first place. You know, it started with math. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I just gravitated towards math and uh, I would do problem sets all the time and then you know eventually I did olympiads and I, I loved doing that it was such a passion um and you know I, I grew up in Albania it's a small country in Europe and this was during the transition from totalitarian communism to uh, this you know liberal capitalism and uh, when I was two the dictatorship regime fell and it was sort of anarchy overnight um, but I think one thing that people sort of misunderstand about these communist regimes is that when everything is equal there is this really fierce competition for knowledge and education is everything. And so that's kind of the setting that I grew up in. And I was just always very hungry for knowledge and the pursuit of knowledge. Um, but in a place where there's, there is this, you know, constant regime change and everything is uncertain, um, I gravitated more towards the truth and science, something that felt steady and you could get to the bottom of. And also, you know, the sources of history books or other books are sort of questionable. <laughs> history kept changing. Um, so I think maybe just intuitive and natural gravitation towards uh, sciences and math was, was amplified by the circumstances in, in which I grew up in. Um, and so from a very young age, I was super interested in math and physics and continued to pursue them, them until um, university. And were your, were your parents mathematicians or scientists? No, not really. Um, they, they actually taught literature. And so uh, it was just an organic uh, interest towards math and science. It's sort of, I mean, from coming from the West, like one of the things that I, um, I'm, I'm a little bit older than, or a lot older than you, uh, I think. <laughs> and, you know, one of the things that struck me growing up, 
uh, where I also was interested in math and science and, you know, programming fairly early on, um, was that there was this competitive nature uh, between um, the, you know, sort of the liberal uh, democracies of the West and, you know, some mm -hmm. of the Russian coalition that like we, it, that knowledge itself, like particularly science and mathematics and mm -hmm. technical knowledge were like one of these things that were highly valued both here and mm -hmm. there at the time, because it was a way to like, you know, just sort of compete in whatever contest it was that we were playing. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it felt like that in Albania or not. Yeah, very much like that. You know, I, I I just love doing all these Olympiads, whether it was chemistry or biology or math. Um, and, you know, when you're a kid, you don't really think about that. It was just a passion. But looking back, I can sort of see the the circumstances and when they're and also just, you know, keep in mind that there wasn't uh, access to a lot of tools or entertainment. And so a lot of it was just out of boredom as well. You know, uh, boredom actually, I think is a very powerful motivator to go explore and really pursue frontiers of anything. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in the first, uh, years of, of my childhood, Albania was incredibly isolated, uh, like North Korea is today. And so there wasn't much inflow of, um, you know, entertainment or anything really besides books. So books were this, this, uh, entire universe. And, you know, it's back, back then I just searched everything in books. Now we've got all these powerful tools in our fingertips and can do anything really. Yeah, I mean, like what you just said, that uh, boredom is a very useful thing, I could not more strongly <laughs> agree with. And I think it's really interesting that we seem to, as a society, have decided that boredom is bad and it is a thing to mm. minimize. And it's one of the mm. things that I struggle with my own children. I've got mm. a 12 and a 14 year old and they don't have the same capacity to be bored as I did when I was mm -hmm. a child. I, I, I didn't grow up in Albania. Like I'm, I'm sure uh, like it's probably uh, unfair to even make this comparison, but you know, like I grew up in rural central Virginia. We had three yeah. television channels and you know, like I was mm -hmm. bored a lot and like most of my life was, <laughs> yeah. it, it, uh, you know, in books and it was, uh, mm -hmm. it was a very useful thing to, you know, I, I got focused very quickly on, uh, things that were substantive. Yeah, I think exactly that. Like exercising that that ability to stay focused on something and, uh, you know, reflect on information or uh, distilling this information further. And a lot of math is, is like that. You just need to sit with the problem forever. Um, and it, it kind of exercises that muscle and faith that if you sit with it, you'll discover something. Yeah, for uh, for sure. I mean, I, I I don't know about you, but I've even uh, had hard math problems that I've worked on in the past where I was so obsessed with them that I would <laughs> dream about them. And I sometimes <laughs> would even wake up and I'm like, oh, finally, like I I've got the I got the proof for this theorem I, uh, that exactly. I just dreamt. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm interested to hear how. You know, that interest that you had, uh, you know, which sounds like it was sort of innate or, you know, in, in the air and cultural, uh, you know, just just from the circumstances of how you grew up. But like, how did it get nurtured? Like some of this stuff is hard. Uh, and so did you have mentors or teachers? Uh, were the schools good? Like, yeah, you know, how did you or, or maybe like I should ask a different way. So like at some point, whenever you are trying to do something substantive, like things get hard enough where you get stuck. So how did you mm -hmm. get yourself unstuck? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for me, my teachers, when I was growing up, they were um, uh, extremely supportive. And it was sort of unusual circumstances because um uh, I, I think today maybe less of that would be available, but uh, back then, I don't know, they, maybe they saw something in me and they really wanted to, um, help me pursue 
my interests. And, you know, often in class I do completely different problem sets because I was bored with the usual curriculum. And I would still sit there with everyone, but they were very supportive in me doing something entirely different. And I was also lucky that my sister is a year and a half older than me. And so when I would get bored with my stuff, I would go and look into her books. And and then when I do her books, then I would find other books. And my teachers were very helpful with that. I think that was probably the most helpful thing. Like I, I always knew there was something else. There was more to pursue. There was more to learn. And then um, when I was 16, I was fortunate to uh, get a scholarship to study abroad in Vancouver in Canada, where I did my last two years of high school. And there was, uh, there was a, a big opportunity, you know, to um, get outside of Albania and study in an international school with people from many different countries. Um, that, was, that was a great opportunity for me. So where did, uh, where did computers enter the picture for you? Um, it, it was quite, uh, late, I would say, um, maybe when I was a teenager in Albania and, you know, internet was slow, but, uh, I, I already thought about intelligence a lot, um, more, more through math and solving problems and, uh, and, and just like how, how the, th the theory of, of how the world works and trying to explain a lot of things through math or physics even. Um, but I was always interested in how the brain works and intelligence, um, more theoretically and at, at abstract levels. Um, but I would say that, you know, the art of sort of what I pursued was more more in the theme of trying to apply uh, my knowledge and try to apply technology to really hard problems that in some way makes our lives better. Um, and when I was in college, I was studying engineering because I thought this was the best way to apply um, my knowledge to actually solving real real problems in the world. And uh, when I was studying engineering, I was very interested in pursuing uh, ways to bring sustainable transport and uh, to the world and also just sustainable energy in general. And so my senior project actually was building this hybrid race car. Um, it was fun, but also we wanted to do something that felt really hard. And so uh, instead of batteries, we used supercapacitors and, um, uh, you know, really trying to push what was possible. And obviously that was not something that you could build in production, but it was pushing science um, and seeing seeing what's possible, uh, and and that's why thereafter I you know I, I went to work at Tesla, and uh, I was really passionate about uh, sustainable energy and uh, sort of doing doing my part in 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 bringing sustainable transport to the world um and that was that was a very exciting time about 10 years ago at, at tesla that's awesome so what 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 type of engineering did you study were you an electrical engineer mechanical engineer uh is, is, is something different yeah i i studied mechanical engineering uh so a lot of hands-on stuff you know software but also hands-on and what was what was your favorite thing about i mean because you're doing something very different now like mechanical mm -hmm. engineering is quite a bit different than uh, like running a software engineering team and like i i love mechanical yeah. engineering it's funny enough like i do uh like i built my entire career on software engineering but like most of what i do in my free time is mechanical engineering and mechanical design um so i like what 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 attracted you to that in the first place other than you know the sort of the sustainable uh like th that it was a lever on to mm -hmm. doing something in sustainable energy and like how how was that different than what you do now yeah, I think back then I probably saw it more as uh, as a more tangible way to uh, change things, and it just felt it didn't feel abstract. It felt very um, 
you know, just very tangible. You 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 make a change and you see it and you see how how it affects reality. Um, and I I was always sort of a tinkerer. I would explore different things. Um, it was hard. Mechanical engineering is hard, uh, but it's also you know, very, very fulfilling. And there was always a software component. So like in a hybrid car, you've got uh, the, the entire uh, system um, and it's it's not just the mechanical engineering part. There's always a uh, software component, the electrical uh, engineering component. So it's kind of um, a little bit of everything. And I, I always was attracted to sort of like complex systems. And, you know, when I was at Tesla, I... I got more and more interested in autopilot, uh, in the promise of it, and uh, also what we could do with AI and computer vision to completely change the way that we, you know, uh, travel. And um, and so that got me more and more interested in AI and what it could do in the world, what sort of changes it could bring. I didn't necessarily want to become a car person. I always had this curiosity for, for different things. And I, I was very curious about how AI would affect the way that we interact with machines and how we interact with information in general. So at the time I got really interested in spatial computing and just interacting with information and complex concepts in a completely different way that we interact even today, really with a keyboard and the mouse, yeah. which is just so limited. Yes. Um, and so I thought that AI and computer vision would help us um, really change this interface of interacting with information. And I imagined, you know, virtual reality or augmented reality where you can almost touch um, molecules or you can get a sense for um, chaos theory or gravitational waves. And that is such an intuitive understanding of concepts, uh, complex concepts versus, you know, when you read it on, on a page, uh, yeah. it's almost like as intuitive as uh, grabbing a, a ball and, you know, getting a sense of projectile motion, even if you don't know the, the laws of physics. And so yeah. I thought, wow, this, this can really change the way that we learn and um, the way we absorb the world. That feels so true to me. I mean, I think one of the things that I really appreciate about the modern world that we live in right now is you have things like YouTube, where mm -hmm. if you are trying to understand a thing, there are so many people trying to explain that thing in so yeah. many different ways <laughs> that if you are determined enough, you can find someone explaining the thing in exactly the right way for your particular mm -hmm. brain exactly. to understand it quickly. And that was mm -hmm. always my struggle. Like I, I could learn very quickly, but like, I don't think I learn exactly the same way that other people mm. learn. Um, and if like I can get the right conceptual hook on something then I've got it and like I can even understand like the things that like before I got the hook were too complicated. It's one of the things actually that it really excites me about what it is that, uh, you know, you all are doing at OpenAI with these agents because you can the, the agent, uh, if you are trying to get it to explain something to you is infinitely patient and it's sort of mm -hmm. adaptable. Like it will explain things to you, uh, like in the way that you need it to explain things uh, to, exactly. if you're willing to like have a conversation and tell it, uh, like what it is that you need. Mm -hmm. That feels very powerful to me. I completely agree. Yeah, it's uh, one of the things that I'm most excited about um, with these large language models and just generally deploying the AI systems that we're building in the real world. Yeah. So let, let's go back for a minute uh, before we get on to all of the exciting AI stuff, which I'm sure is what everyone wants to wants to hear us talk about. Uh, like, I want to hear uh, a little bit about Tesla. So, uh, like, what uh, what was it like working there? And uh, like, you you had a pretty big responsibility there. Uh, like at at the end, where you were the 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 head product manager for the 
for the Model X, which is like one of the mm-hmm. most amazing uh, innovative vehicles that anyone's ever created. So for you not thinking of yourself as a car person, like you help make one of the mm-hmm. yeah the most disruptive cars that uh, the world has seen, uh, like maybe in the past you know, 40, 50 years. Uh, so like, tell us a little <laughs> bit about that. You know, Tesla was an incredible place. And in some ways, actually, I find it quite similar to OpenAI now where you have, obviously, it was much bigger and working on something very different. But this high density of very talented, um, smart people that are just so passionate about what they're doing, it's almost... um you know, it's, it's, it's almost like a spiritual pursuit. Everyone believed so hard in what they were doing and that being the most important thing. Um, and that is just so powerful when you're working, you know, on really hard problems. And in the case of Tesla, it's, you know, transforming an entire industry versus creating many new ones as well as, uh, transforming them. And, uh, you know, it was incredibly hard, but also just invigorating and, uh, so fun. And I, I learned so much in a short amount of time. Um, I, I, I don't think it's normal, you know, to build a, a car from zero to one, you know, in just three, four years. It's a very short time. Uh, these things usually have this like very long, uh, uh, life cycle or uh, timelines in in terms of uh, design and prototyping and then production and so on. Um, And, you know, one of the things that I I learned at Tesla was that there, there is always some, some different way, even if it seems impossible, there is all, there is always a way, there is always a different way. And, you know, in product in general, there's, this kind of two ways of building product where you have the really, really polished stuff. And then this way of kind of hacking and iterating um, and, you know, getting a lot of feedback from your user base and customers and just iterating quickly on that. Um, And Tesla, I'd say was in between kind of doing both. And that was incredible. I mean, just the first time of operating like that, in an industry that is so established. Um, and so I learned a lot of, uh, I, I learned a lot, especially from, you know, just the power of being creative and thinking originally, um, and just really changing everything, um, uh, and, and questioning what you know and questioning why, why things are done a certain way. Um, and I also just, that was the place where I, I started getting really interested into um, the power of AI and how it would change everything that we do. Um, so in a sense, it was, you know, uh, in, in my career, it was the place that really uh, catalyzed my interest in working in AI. And then, of course, after working in VR and AR, I, I just thought, okay, intelligence is really the fundamental property of of how the world is going to change. And so then I, I got more and more interested on um, less the application side of it, but really understanding what general intelligence meant and how we could build it and how, you know, we make things go well for the world if we do build it. Yeah. So what, well, yeah, b- before we move on to AI, like what's a, uh, if you can share like an interesting technical problem, uh, or like technical thing that you learned, uh, on the model X, uh, you know, like something that was uh, tricky or interesting or different. So many things. Um, <laughs> So many things I could talk about the Falcon doors, but yeah. I feel like that could be that could be problematic. But like may, maybe at a high level we could sort of talk yeah. about that. So like that is uh that is an interesting design choice to make. So obviously a brand new thing and like um you know, as an engineer, like I don't know the details of the implementation, but like I can imagine how difficult it was uh, to 
make that feature of the car work technically. Um, did you all have a sense for, and, and I'm sure like there are just dozens of these things in a car where like, you know, some designer has this idea that I want to do this thing. And then some engineer has to go decide or figure out like how to make the thing work. Like in just in general, like how do you balance yeah. those two things? Yeah, th there were a lot of things about the Model X that felt, um, you know, just really pushing uh, the envelope and just that had never been done before. Um, or especially in that in that uh, kind of car, and so uh, you know, like the doors were a feature like that, or the HVAC system, uh, the HEPA filter, um, and it always required kind of bringing together the whole team, all the parts that would be working together. So design, engineering, manufacturing, um, you know, the software side of the team to, or maybe if it was relevant, you know, the electrical engineers and really bringing together all the pieces so you could kind of design it together versus hand it off um, yeah. and they go back and forth or like, you know, design something that could not be manufactured. Um, so that was, that was very powerful, you know, in kind of working with teams that have different backgrounds, domain expertise, figuring out how to, you know, design something that has never been done before, adopting new ideas, but also very quickly kind of killing old ideas and moving on to the to the next one um, and just like figuring out the right problem to work on um, at the right time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that is uh, like an incredibly important thing. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 th this idea of like you do your work and then throw it over the wall to like the the next uh, you know, person or team and the change that has to go do the next thing uh, is, um, you know, th there's a certain sort of efficiency that you can get from doing things that way. But if you're trying to make something brand new, it's very mm -hmm. difficult to like have these sort of waterfall processes like that mm -hmm. i mean there's so many jokes about yeah. uh you know like one of the things <laughs> i was going to ask you about as a mechanical engineer is like hey did you spend any time in the machine shop because like there's this yes. tension between Plenty. mechanical <laughs> engineers and machinists it's like oh you like gave me this print and like there's no way to make it mm -hmm. or you know there's the tension in software engineering between the product managers and the engineers like you know the product manager says we're going to go do this thing and the engineers are like mm -hmm. oh are you crazy and so like it usually exactly. works better when everybody is is like in the conversation. So it's super interesting to hear you say that's how you all did your work. Yeah, totally. And uh, yeah, it's funny that you mentioned it because I, as a mechanical engineer, I was often machining my own parts just to understand sort of the constraint limitations and also just the challenges of doing it. And it was very similar at Tesla where the, you know, design engineers were often on the floor, um, you know, fitting, testing the parts um, and just working very closely with manufacturing engineers. Um, yeah. And I think, that's like you said it's it's key to innovating at scale past a certain size of the company it's difficult to innovate if you're just throwing things over the wall and uh you know like bureaucracy can kick in or processes and you know as they grow companies can lose their vision and sort of stop pursuing new ideas but um uh, you know, if you kind of cut through that and minimize sort of the layers of processes and things or hoops that you have to jump through to, to get something done or bring some new idea, um, then I think it's, it's much easier. So th that was something actually quite critical looking back that I learned working at Tesla. Yeah, I was, uh, I was listening, um, uh, uh, long while ago of a uh, interview that uh, like Elon was doing where he was describing this thing that was happening, not, not with the model X, uh, um, but like another one of the automobiles where they were having a really 
challenging time getting something manufactured. Um, Mm -hmm. And as soon as he started like asking the right questions, it turned out that uh, like the problem wasn't solving the problem of, of like how to make this particular thing uh, like, you know, actually manufacturable uh um it was like why did this thing exist at all like it was just completely Mm -hmm. unnecessary uh, that it Mm -hmm. got designed the way that it got designed and like the real fix wasn't to like go solve the nasty hard problem uh because the thing itself was a little bit arbitrary and it's like changed mm-hmm. the initial conditions and then the problem gets easier to solve. And so I think that's a, it's one of the things I admire a lot about Elon is like this first mm-hmm. principles thinking of always like being able to sort of step back and, and, you know, ask the right questions about why are we doing a thing the way that we're doing it and like what is necessary and what is not. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's incredibly important stepping back and not, I mean, having the ability to be immersed in details and dig deep when you need to, but also stepping back and asking the the right questions and having uh, sort of this high degree of adaptability in the team for and, and tolerance for ambiguity. Um, because, you know, especially when people are extremely experienced, they, they have a certain way of doing things. And so you kind of need to be adaptable and um, also, you know, kind of believe and disbelieve things at the same time. Um, and and that's uh, those are hard, hard qualities and traits to sort of sit together. Yeah. And, and then there's just something about big organizations like, you know, mm-hmm. organizations organizations should only be big if the nature of the problem that they're solving for their stakeholders requires you to be big uh, because yeah. bigness is almost like a flavor of entropy that forces some of mm-hmm. this uh, stuff to happen where like, you know, you, you just because of the complexity of the whole, uh, like no one has all of the details in their head. And so like you can find well, yourself trapped in like you know do you just feverishly working as hard as you can on the details of something and if you could pull all the way back you would just find that the thing that you're working so hard on is like completely unnecessary um yeah. you know and so it's one of the great things about like the size that open ai is at right now is uh like mm. you you sort of still institutionally like you know uh and the complexity of things you can you, you have less of that weird, you know, entropy that happens to big organizations. And so, you know, the thing that I found is you, you just have to fight against mm-hmm. it super hard because if you, if you're not pushing back against this thing, you're just letting people entirely optimize for the narrow thing. Like it just mm-hmm. metastasizes into, mm-hmm. um, you know, confusion basically, and mm-hmm. like people optimizing for the wrong thing. Yeah, and certain momentum just carries on. Yeah, so let's mm-hmm. uh, let's talk about AI. Like, how? Yeah. Let, let's sort of start with like, how did you make the transition from Tesla to OpenAI? Because you were in very early from the beginning. Uh, like, it, it wasn't obvious uh, at at the start that like not obvious at all uh, not at that all. you were going to get to where you're at now. So like mm-hmm. what made you take the leap? Yeah. So after um, I was, after I worked in uh, VR and AR and was really intent on defining the new interface for spatial computing back then, it was a bit early, I think too, too early for VR and AR, but uh I, at that time, I actually got really interested in, you know, how AI can help us just redefine the way that we interact with the world and we absorb information and the things that we produce and how it affects creativity. Um, and so just, you know, this entire concept of amplifying our intelligence, um, and what, what that means. And so, um, you know, I, was really interested in learning more and seeing where this can go, this idea of pushing intelligence as a fundamental 
property that can have this very broad universal impact. And, you know, at the time I, I wasn't sure whether, uh, what, what the chances of that are to go all the way to artificial general intelligence. Um, but I was just very interested in figuring out how far we could pursue it. And it really seemed like maybe the last thing that we'd ever work on. And it seemed like the most important thing that I could work on. And, um, it was important to me to, to work on it, um, at, at a place that cared about making sure that it goes well for the world. And so, um, I joined OpenAI when it was a nonprofit and, um, and, you know, the, the mission of the company was then and still is to make sure that building AGI goes well for for everyone in the world and uh, people can can benefit from uh, what it will bring um, and obviously since then for practical reasons we've evolved the structure of the company to uh, have it be a limited partnership with a capped uh, profit so it still maintains the same mission and the non-profit oversees uh, the mission of the company uh, but you know uh, I just sort of pursued my curiosity and what felt like the most important thing to me at the time. Yeah. Which I like, honestly, I think is super good career advice for anyone. Um, being able to make choices about what you do, where you believe the thing that you're working mm -hmm. on is like the most important thing you can make a contribution yeah. to. I, I think is, you know, a thing people don't think deliberately enough about. Hmm. I think it's so important because when you're working on really hard things, it's that that passion, that innate curiosity is the thing that can pull you through. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, like just uh, I really glad you said that because I I say this to people all the time. It's if you're working on a really hard problem with a bunch of really smart, highly mm -hmm. motivated people. It's hard. Like most <laughs> days you're failing. So you go in <laughs> exactly. and you're trying something and it doesn't work and you're frustrated with yourself and you're frustrated with the people around you. And mm -hmm. they, there are only a very small number of things that you can have that will um, help you do that day after day after day until mm -hmm. you've actually solved the problem uh, and you, you like get something that matters. And if you quit yeah. before you solve the problem, then you haven't solved the problem. Like you've got nothing <laughs> but this accumulated frustration that you've had. Um, and like, you know, and I, I think one of the very few things that you can have that will get you through is like, you have to believe that it's the most important thing that you could be mm -hmm. doing. You have to believe that mm -hmm. it matters like money's not enough uh mm -hmm. you know your mom wanting you to do it isn't enough uh, like you know it looking good on your resume isn't enough like yeah. you have to <laughs> just deeply deeply believe that it, it's mm -hmm. the most important thing you could be doing yeah exactly and it's hard to find that faith and belief uh, and you almost have to experiment a bit through uh I mean, your entire life and sometimes yeah. to just really find what, what that is, what is that thing that really brings you this, um, satisfaction. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, at some point you also have to figure out like what your mechanism is for dealing with that frustration of like mm -hmm. friction and <laughs> failure. Um, you know, because, you know, it's tough. I mean, I'm sure this is, for everything that you've done, because you you seem to have uh, repeatedly chosen to do very hard things. Uh, like I know for me, like I repeatedly choose to like do, I mean, it's almost like, you know, the most important thing is al almost always like the hardest thing uh, mm -hmm. you could choose to do. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, just being able to like sustain that over time is yeah, interesting. Because at some point too, you also, you know, like you probably had enough success from your career at Tesla where you could have chosen like, you know, just from a success perspective uh, to not do the hardest thing. You could be mm -hmm. like, all right, well, I could go do something slightly easier than like try to make an AGI like in a nonprofit, right? That's 
<laughs> sounds impossibly <laughs> hard. <laughs> when you put it like that, yes. <laughs> yes, in fact. Uh. Yeah, may- maybe another thing to talk about is like when you are w- – one of the things that I think – has helped OpenAI be very successful is you have really excellent people, uh, folks who are, you know, in their particular domain, whether it's, you know, figuring out how to uh, like ring numeric performance out of a GPU, or if it's someone who understands how to do safety and alignment work or whether it's someone who understands like how to architect a deep neural network, um, someone who understands distributed systems. So you have like just people who are at the very top of their game in each one of those areas. And you also have this mission, um, you know, like how do you, how do you go solve this incredibly complicated problem that, you know, not just open AI, but like humanity has been, you know, sort of thinking about for, thousands of years and like how do you mm-hmm. make that a reality and like how do you do it in a way where you know it, it creates massive benefits for humanity um so but you've got this third thing that's interesting which is a way to keep people focused on moving forward and progress mm-hmm. so like you could have the mission and you could have all of these smart people but like they could be running in a thousand different directions uh mm-hmm. and like their work could not be accruing to like a thing that's making progress. And I think that's sort of the extraordinary third thing that you all have been able to do. And I don't know, don't don't know whether you share that same perspective or, you know, like it, it, you know, I'm just sort of curious on your take of like what that missing element is. Cause like lots of labs out there with really smart Mm -hmm. people spending a lot of money and, you know, they've got a, interesting intellectual mm-hmm. mission and they still haven't been able to make the sort of progress that you all have made it's incredibly hard um like you say you know you can have this incredibly talented people and high density of them and they're innately curious and they're you know forever in pursuit of discovery and something new but you need to that, that needs to compound you need to have all the smart people working together on kind of similar or same bets. Um, And, you know, it's, you want to motivate people. You you don't hire smart people, tell them what to do. And, but you you want them to be motivated and aligned enough to kind of work on similar or the same things. And at OpenAI, I think one of the most important things that we managed to do well was um, take a bet or take a couple of bets on the things that we believe the most and get alignment on those very early on. And even, you know, at, at, at the stage of recruiting people actually and bringing them in, that's most important and making sure they're really aligned on those things. Um, and it's hard to say no, especially when there is so much yes. opportunity and you could be working on all these different ideas. It's incredibly hard to say no. Um, and so, and you doubt yourself and, uh, you know, it might take a while for, for these bets to pan out, um, uh, you know, like the scaling laws and, and focusing on one large model, a ton of data, a ton of compute, which now it's obvious, but back then not so much. Um, and, and getting alignment on that is in- incredibly hard, but I think it goes back to this idea of like figuring out how you work on the right problem at the right yeah. time. Um, and having faith on, on that. Yeah. I, I, I want to double click on this, uh, this this notion of it's hard to say no um it, it's incredibly hard to say no mm-hmm. because like the thing that you're faced with is cto of open ai uh and like i i've, I've had a lot of this over the past two decades <laughs> is you yeah. you will have the smartest people in the world coming to mm-hmm. you with very good ideas um ideas that you think are interesting and like uh, mm-hmm. you're a curious person and you're like oh that's mm-hmm. amazing like I, I i love this uh and then you know that 
that idea is not on the path that you're pursuing. Uh, mm -hmm. And it might not be the next Im most important thing to go work on if you're choosing the next most important thing. And just saying no is tough. And like, you're also a good person. And like, you know, the people that you're working <laughs> with are good, good people. And like, you don't want to disappoint them and you don't want them yeah. to be sad. And, and so it's a real art form, I think, of like, mm -hmm. And, and, you know, to, it's two parts. It's like having the confidence and the courage to say no yourself uh, when you mm -hmm. also have your own uncertainties. Uh, like, am I wrong? Like, am I making the right call? Uh, and then being able to, like, deliver the no where it's not a no, it's sort of a no, but it's no, <laughs> you know, but like, here's this other thing that, you know, like, I, I think if you do that, it will be even more interesting and, you know, create more impact. Uh it's hard. Exactly. It is extremely hard. And with that, together with that goes this, uh, you know, building the muscle as an organization to sort of um, learn new things quickly or learn what's not going to work very quickly and adopt what's going to work very quickly and kill the old ideas quickly. Yeah. It is hard to kill things that are already, you know, maybe working, but they're not working as well as something new that you could be doing. Yeah. Well, look, I, I think, you know, that that's another thing that you all do really well. Uh, and it's um, and it's very, very, very important is mm -hmm. choosing when to stop doing things. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, you know, like, for, for instance, you all had uh, like an incredibly great demo a handful of years ago of uh, a uh, robotic hand that could uh right. single hand uh solve a rubik's cube uh and like it right. was uh you know a demo that was um you know trying to get a reinforcement learning system to learn a mm -hmm. robotic uh, kinematic model um mm -hmm. and so like it's technically interesting work it's a super cool demo but like you all decided like this isn't on the path so like we're gonna stop right. working on this and like that's a hard yeah, decision exactly. because that was a lot of work for someone. It was like their favorite mm -hmm. thing in the world. Uh, you know, it's like yeah, people may quit uh, like because you know you stop doing this thing and that's the thing they wanted to work on. So they're going to go find you know uh, some other place to go work on it. Um, but but it's important, um, mm -hmm. like really important. Yeah, exactly. It was you know at the time it was a very big bet that the company was making and. Uh, uh, you know, we had that and, and Dora and we sort of had this inflection point that, okay, what are we trying to learn? What, how, how does this, um, how, how does this fit in on our path to AGI and yeah. is there a better way? Um, and so yeah. we're choosing to stop working on it if there's a better way. Yeah. You, you've said a lot of like very important, profound things. Like you just said something, uh, like I, that that I think is also very important is like what are we trying to learn? Like mm -hmm. if, if more people ask that question deliberately, uh like we would we would have a much better world and like people <laughs> would have more success. But like I mean that that is in essence, I think, you know, one of the one of the things that you all have always had pretty good focus on. It's like you're not doing activity for the sake of activity or mm -hmm. like doing activity for the sake of like proving that you're smart. It's like we have a specific thing we're trying to learn through these things that we're doing. And and, and it doesn't have to be AI. It could be product mm -hmm. design or it could be, you know, like parenting or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, like just trying, yeah. you know, like what are you trying to learn, uh, you know, mm -hmm. through this thing that you're doing? Let's talk a little bit about... Um, I mean, you, you all have had an unbelievable, um, like total run, but like in in particular, the past year, or e even even the past six months, have been, I think, shocking to uh, a bunch of folks. Um, I, I've been following what you all have been doing for a while, of and course. so you know, like you know, what happened the past six months wasn't so. I mean, it was like surprising to me. Um, but not quite as shocking to folks who, you know, sort of saw nothing, nothing, nothing. And then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. like, you know, chat GPT emerges and it like mm -hmm. becomes the, the most interesting thing in the world. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about that journey, because, you know, I, I think chat GPT is just one point on uh, like a long set of efforts uh, that you all have been working on. And like, it's not 
even the last thing, right? Uh, so like that's the mm-hmm. other thing you know, people are, probably aren't internalizing that, you know, it, it is a point on a curve uh, and like, you know, more things are coming. Um, so like, h- how have you all thought about that? Like in, in the context of how the public's yeah. reacting? You know, uh, the first time that we thought about deploying these models that were just in research territory uh, was kind of a, this insane idea. It wasn't normal back then to go deploy a large language model in the real world. And, you know, what is the business case? What is it actually going to do for people? What problems is it going to solve? Like, we didn't really have those answers. Uh, but we thought, you know, if we make it accessible in such a way that it, it's easy to use and it is cheap to use. Um, it is highly optimized. You don't need a lot of, um, you don't need to know all the bells and whistles of machine learning. Um, and just accessible, then maybe people's creativity would just bring to life, you know, new products and solutions. And we'd see how this technology could, could help us in the real world. And of course we had a hypothesis, but, but really it was just putting GPT-3 in the API the first time that we saw people interact with these large language models and the technology that we were building and that for so many years we had just been building in the lab without, you know, this real world contact and feedback from people out there. Um, so that was, that was the first time it was sort of this leap of faith that it was going to teach us something. We were going to learn something from it. And hopefully we could feed it back into the technology. We could bring back that knowledge, that feedback and figure out how to use it to make the technology better, more reliable, more aligned, safer, more robust when it eventually gets deployed in the real world. Um, and, you know, I, I always believe that you can just build this powerful technology in the lab with no contact with reality and hope that somehow it's going to go well um, and that it's going to be safe and beneficial for all. And somehow you do need to figure out how to bring society along, both in gathering that feedback and insight, but also in adjusting society to this change. And the best way to do that is for people to actually interact um, with the technology and see for themselves instead of, you know, telling them or uh, just sharing scientific papers. Um, so, so that was very important. And it took us then a couple of years to get to the point where um, we were not just releasing improvements to the model through the API, but um, in fact, the first interface that was more consumer facing that we played around with was DALI, DALI Labs, where people could just input a prompt in natural language. And then you'd see this beautiful, original, amazing images come up. Um, and, and then, you know, really for research reasons, we were um, experimenting with this interface of dialogue where you go back and forth with the model in chat GPT. And uh, dialogue is such a powerful tool, you know, the idea of Socratic dialogue and how, how people learn. You can sort of correct one another um, and or ask questions, get really to a deep, deeper truth. And so we thought, you know, if we put this out there, even with the existing models, um, we will learn a lot. We will get a lot of feedback and we can use this feedback uh, to actually make our upcoming model that at the time was GPT-4 safer and and more aligned. So that was kind of the motivation. And of course, as we saw, you know, in just a few days, it became super popular and people just loved interacting with this AI system. One of the reasons why just me personally, um, I've been excited about the work that you all are doing is like this notion that you want to really allow a lot of people, a lot of non-expert mm. people to be able to play around with the technology and to imagine how they can use it for things that they think are important is super important to to me. Um, 
and you know may, maybe a little bit is uh, of the same is true for you but like i grew up mm-hmm. not in uh like one of the coastal innovation centers where yeah. things like these ai systems get created mm-hmm. um i like you did not have uh like computer scientists or engineer parents um and the problems that people have in rural central virginia and i'm guessing the problems that people have in albania like you know Mm -hmm. some of them are common across the board but some of them are like very different and like some of them Mm -hmm. like you can't even imagine like if your entire worldview is like you know, I went to Stanford. Uh, mm-hmm. I, you know, got a job at like one of the biggest technology companies in the world. And, you know, like I'm building this technology and like I, you know, I have to imagine all of its possible uses. Uh, mm-hmm. Like you just can't even imagine what life is like for, of you know, someone yeah. from Albania or, or rural Virginia. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think it's really unbelievably important to like mm-hmm. have these things be platforms that aren't uh you know aren't just getting built in a lab where all the consequential mm-hmm. decisions get made without any contact with the real world um and that exactly. doesn't mean that you 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 have to i mean th- and this is the last thing i want to you know chat about before we run out of time but like it you know it it creates this very very hard problem of uh like how you do responsible mm-hmm. ai um, because like you, you, you get this big benefit of lots of people participating, but then you get this mm-hmm. big bucket of things that you have to go solve at the same time to make sure that, you know, it, it's not creating a whole bunch of harm. So like, you know, talk, talk a little bit about how you all think about that. Yeah, that's, um, well put. It's all about these trade-offs and minimizing. You can't, you, you can't have zero risk. We're really minimizing, uh, those harms and actually really being able to <coughs> respond quickly, um, <clears throat> and iterate quickly on, uh, uh, on being able to maybe make changes to the, models themselves or introduce tools um, or um, policies basically to contain to contain those harms and um, uh, that's very difficult because o- often we're kind of doing all of this in the public eye we're not we don't we don't have the privilege of you know doing it behind closed doors and so obviously um, with that comes a certain responsibility um, but I, I think actually there is no other way to do it um, I think yeah. it's the only way to get it right it, it does need to be in the public eye and it needs to be in this continuous iterative cycle because the rate of technological advancement right now is insane and so if you hold these systems back in the lab, you know, the difference between, like, if we had never released GPT-3 or 3.5 and we had just gone out with GPT-4 on chat GPT, that would have shocked the world. It already did. And, yeah. you know, we we had this continuous development cycle. Um, yeah. And and so I think that's, that's really important. But one of the things is to really, for, for me, to deployment from uh, every time that we put out a model, uh, we we learn something. We learn something about um, maybe you know uh, the the safety of 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 our systems in the early development cycle or in post training or um, in the product cycle. Safety is really deeply embedded and integrated at each. Uh, stage of developing and deploying these models and we're constantly changing what we're doing because we're just constantly learning new things like every week i would say we're learning something new Um, and so whether it's you know how you uh, think about the data that you're selecting and filtering and um analyzing the data early on uh, or about the RL, the reinforcement learning with human feedback process that makes these models more aligned or, uh, you know, classifiers that we use in production or the tools that we're making available for developers to have control and be able to be in the driver's seat and steer um, the, these models. Um, they're you know all these all these pieces along the life cycle of taking research to production. 
it's a complicated set of things to manage these trade-offs. Um, but but I, I agree with you. I don't know if there is any other reasonable mm-hmm. alternative. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think the the trick is like having uh, having lots and lots of inputs that are coming into you, uh, like yeah. where you can sort of hear the, you know, what's working, what's not working, uh, like mm-hmm. what 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 is the scrutiny, uh, you know, like w- mm-hmm. which, which of the yeah, which of the problems that uh, like seem substantial or not and like which of the, you know, you know, things that people are seeing um you know in, in some weird permutation of how they're trying to use the product that you never imagined or intended uh like exactly. you know, creates yeah so it, it it is uh you know on the one hand like you know sort of very exciting uh but it's also like a huge responsibility i think mm-hmm. it is we're working on something that will will change everything will change the way that we work uh, the way that we interact with each other and yeah. the way that we think and uh, everything, really, all aspects of life. Yeah. I have one last question for you that I ask everybody who's on the podcast. So I, I know you probably have no free time given the you know, <laughs> intensity of the past, uh, really, you know, year. Um but uh, I ask everyone what they do outside of work uh, for uh, for fun. Uh, I love reading and I love going for hikes. Uh, hiking is one of my favorite things to do, being in nature. Yeah, and like we we live in a good place uh, for hiking, yeah, uh, which is uh, which is good. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mira, for taking time out of a. Uh, in- incredibly busy schedule to have this conversation i've learned a ton and uh you know just enjoy uh enjoy this conversation and enjoy uh being able to work with you on a regular basis awesome i do too thanks so much Kevin. so wow that was a fascinating conversation with mira Marathi. Um, as as close partners, I get to work with Mira and her team all the time, uh, helping to develop some of the big AI systems that they're building, and then figuring out how to safely deploy those uh, those you know, unbelievably uh, sophisticated AI systems into the products that we're building. Uh, but like, I learned a ton about Mira today that I didn't know before. Like, I knew she was from Albania, but I uh, had known relatively little about how she first got interested in uh, science and technology in the first place. Uh, and, you know, it was so great to hear about her, her teachers, her, uh, you know, like always uh, being had and having those teachers who were nurturing the curiosity that she had, her going through her sister's uh, textbooks when she got bored with the stuff that she was working on. Uh, her sister's, uh, I think she said, a year and a half older than uh, she she was. And then, you know, when she got uh, bored with her sister's stuff, uh, you know, figuring out, um, you know, what else there was to learn. And I think, you know, you, you sort of heard at a bunch of places in our conversation like that, you know, what am I going to go learn next? Like, why is that thing important to learn? And this belief that there is always something more to go learn is like one of the things I think that has driven Mira to such success and the the teams that she's responsible for leading to success. Uh, And I think it's a good piece of career advice for all of us to be just very intentional about how we're thinking about you know, the activity that we're doing right now is an opportunity to learn something that will help us get better and better at our jobs and to be more purposeful about how we invest more of our energy and in something into the future. Um, it was awesome to hear about her experience at Tesla, uh, which I think has really shaped how she uh, does her job as a leader and how she tackles like these sort of complicated things where they are multidisciplinary, uh, you know, intersectional 
teams where you have to pull a lot of people together with a lot of different points of view to like do some of these super complicated things. Uh, and just, you know, hearing her talk about her passion for intelligence and like what that means for how we're going to interface with complicated bits of technology and, uh, you know, like how, they really have been thinking for a long while about how they take what they do and package it in a way where lots of people can use it um, and where you really can unlock the imagination and the curiosity of a lot of other people. So uh, like you're empowering them to use this technology to do the interesting things uh, uh, from their points of view. Um so anyway, it was just a sort of a fascinating conversation. There were more tidbits uh, in there. Uh, like I found myself uh, during the conversation remarking on several points where like she said something almost in passing that I thought were like real super valuable nuggets of wisdom. Uh, so I, I hope everybody gets a chance to uh, like reflect on what this, uh, yeah, what this conversation Re really means um and and that's all the time we have for today a uh, big thanks to mira mirati uh, for joining us if you have anything you'd like to share with us please email us anytime at behind the tech at microsoft.com uh, you can follow us on youtube and on any of the usual places that uh, you go get your podcast goodness um and uh until then like we'll see you next time